I'm bad for you. I'm over there. Yeah, I think you said we're ready. It's good to see everybody at Hardison tonight. Let's get a songbook and turn to 617. And as we stand, I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Celestial shore, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away when the shadows of this life is gone. Bird from prison for the phone. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll. this evening. Just good to be in God's house. Appreciate those that might be watching by a live stream this evening. Appreciate you joining in with us on service. Well, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. We, how many of y'all got rain today? We got a few, maybe drops. There's a few drops out here this afternoon, about three so three or so, and I ran through a pretty good little rain over near Brother Bryant's house headed home this afternoon, and boy, it's been just spotty, but praise the Lord for that little bit we got today. Let's go ahead and uh, and ask God to meet with us, help us. Father, we thank you for the day, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. We do thank you for the rain that you sent our way. And Lord, we do pray for you to uh, send more rain to us, Lord. We know in your perfect time and you will. God, I pray that you'd be with those that's not able to be here tonight. Lord, we know there's some sick in different places, some traveling. God, just be with each one. God, help us today. Uh, Lord, I pray that everything done here tonight be glorified to the precious name of Jesus. Lord, we'd sing. These songs are songs to worship you with, Lord, and the, uh, to preach truth from the pulpit, Lord, that our hearts would be drawn closer to you. I pray that you'd be with our young people in back. Lord, I pray that you'd be with the workers in back, Lord, that, um, Lord, just make, uh, say things that would help those children be closer to you, Lord. God, we love you. We thank you for being so good to us, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 603. 603 There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of a blast And our spirit shall draw no more Not a 
aside for a blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore and for our last song we'll sing page 300 the way of the cross leads home cross there's no other way but this i shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross i miss the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to know as i onward go cross leads home. I must need go on to the blood sprinkling way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the height sublime, where the soul is now with God, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. Sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in its narrow more. For the Lord says, Come, and I seek my home where He waits at the open door. Leads home, the way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Amen. Thank you, Brother Cross. Why well, it's tough to hang you that out on that E on that whole note there toward the end of that and I don't know about y'all but by the time I get there I'm about out of breath <laughs> y'all turn to Genesis Before we start tonight, just want to mention uh, it's really the only thing we got special. Uh, by, by the way, you might, you might when you get through, I mean, when we get through in here, uh, walk back to the back and see they've swapped up and been using the fellowship hall for Wednesday nights, and they swapped up and decided to put in that that extra classroom. I don't know what who used to be in there, but that classroom. On the left side of the hall, they've decorated up kind of like a little farm scene and, 
and all, and got a little different series they're doing through the summer and all, but it looks real nice now. I know the children will be excited to have like their own little classroom and, and uh, be in there and all, but maybe want to go back there and, and uh, see that before you go, what they're doing. Um, did did y'all get to bring the little surprise for them tonight? No. Do I? We're do it next, next week. week. Okay, okay. I told them it was a surprise. Oh, they're going to be mad at me. Maybe they'll. Maybe they they don't know what it was though. So maybe the little experiment they're doing will be a good surprise for them. But um, we're all going to dismiss and go back there next week then. When you, <laughs> okay. Yeah. We like to run over a sister on the way to church, too. <laughs> oh, Bunny, I mean, what about that big run across? I was like, oh, man, I'm glad I didn't hit it. I don't, I don't like, it's not so bad when you put them in the pot, but when you just run over them, that makes it worse, doesn't it? Ladies meeting Saturday. That's the only thing we got right now. Uh, as far as everybody else concerned and all, but uh, anyway, ladies meeting Saturday, 1030. Getting mixed up with a men's meeting time and all, but 10.30 here at Church and Fellowship Hall. Just encourage you to participate in that if you could. Good to have Mr. Nice back with us tonight. Missed you. Daniel, good to see you tonight. That, if that table's in your way, brother, feel free to move it over the side or whatever. You can stand on it if you want to. Or sit on whatever. I had that little air freshener ran it up there several hours. And uh, that, But if it's in your way, feel free to move it. Or you can sit your Bible on it or whatever you want to. Amen. It's good to see you back tonight. Good to see Mr. Neese. It's good to be back in God's house. Um, I guess that's all as far as announcements. Can't think of anything else right off the top of my head. But Genesis 1, I'm just going to read one verse. Um, that's hard for me to do. Uh, but Genesis 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, the last two weeks, we've looked at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, there with Hannah and the prayer she prayed and talked about the subject of the sovereignty of God. We've looked at the things she said in that prayer, and she called them out as being her, the, the greatest. Uh, well, I got this verse, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God, as, as, as uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. We talked about that, but let's, uh, anyway, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight as we consider the subject of your sovereignty. God, we just realize in our hearts, Lord, and, and uh, day by day, Lord, I believe we'd find a great peace in our heart when we realize and understand that you are a sovereign God, Lord, all-knowing, all-powerful, Lord, in control of everything that goes on. And God, for that, we praise you, and I pray that you'd help me to preach truth tonight that would be stirred in our heart. Lord, Lord, maybe someone might find a place of comfort in the truth of sovereignty. Lord, uh, maybe it might be someone here today that's never been saved. God, they, Lord, they realize they need to get saved. Lord, ever high that you'd work in each heart tonight, I pray that you'd work in all of our hearts. Lord, help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The sovereignty of God. In Genesis uh, 1 1, I. It's so ironic, you know, in the place I've been looking at this was in the office day, uh, working on this for this evening, and uh, the Keith Long Care guy shows up, and I, the alarm went off, and I looked at my phone, and there wasn't anybody I knew, so I kind of walked over and looked, and he, his two new employees went out and walked to talk to him, and for a minute, moved the van around for him and all, and I thought, you know what, let me go talk to him about the Lord, invite him to church and all, and, and uh you know, it's kind of funny. People got their own thought, thoughts about the Lord and the Bible and everything and all. And fellas first started off telling me he didn't think that Christians really need to go to church and all that we need to. I don't remember how he worked and all. He wasn't he wasn't like anti God or nothing, but had his own views. He'd say, "Well, I believe in the way I feel and all that," and you know, I'd give him Bible answers for it and just lovingly talk to the fella and told him what the Bible said and all. He he was really open and talked real good, but he was asking questions. He said he's got a lot of questions. I said, "We all do." I, you know, there's a lot of questions. I understand that, you know. But he was asking about where God come from. And I said, well, he's always been. I said, his name itself, the etern- Jehovah is eternal, self-existent God. Uh, you know, his name itself implies that he's eternal, he's always been. He said, but where, you know, bef- there was this, there was that, and there was all the planets, stars, and all that. I said, well, he made them. Well, well where did he come from? Where He's always been. 
You know, and, and, and uh, you know, as it gets down to, I, I look at it this way, and I don't believe a person that would ask that question, I wouldn't believe they couldn't be saved. I'm not going to go out on limbs. That's not my place to do that and all. But, but what I would say is people try to figure God out and try to a lot of times get caught up on things like that rather than the fact that he loves them and he died on the cross for them. That's the main thing they need to worry about. And uh, you'll, you'll come to understanding one day, if you're saved, you'll understand one day uh, you won't be worried about the age of the rock, you'll be worried about the rock of ages and put your focus in the right places. But it's just kind of funny when you talk to people that uh, they've got just different ideas and they come up with their own uh, thoughts and, and so forth. But, but in the beginning... Those three little words in the beginning, and it goes on, God created the heavens and the earth. But to see that God was before there was, in the verses to come, before there was time. You think about it, before there was any recording or knowledge of time or anything, why was God concerned with time? He does things when he wants to. He does, he does, God's, I don't think God's ever looked at the calendar and said, wait a minute, we got June 14th coming up. I think I need to do this. June 14th set by what God does, not God set by what June 14th on the calendar says, nor the times and days when times, you know, when those things came about, it's when God set them in order. And we didn't have days. We didn't, there, well, we, we didn't have anything. There was no days. He said, and that was the first day as he created those, the things in those times. Before that, it was just infinite space of time. And then time with numbers became about before there was heavens. I, I assume there was vast space, but nothing in them. I said, I assume, I don't know. I wouldn't argue that. I said he created the heavens and the earth. I've always took that, that the heavens meaning the bodies that create and make up the heavens, the, the galaxies and all that. But the earth, the things he made, it's interesting that he talked about the darkness of verse two and, um, uh, in verse 3, he says, and let there be light, and there was light, but it was on down at day 5, I believe, before he made the lesser and greater lights that divide day and night and all that. So where'd that light come from? Good question to ponder there. I mean, I believe I know where it come from. I believe it's his own holiness, holiness radiating that he made the light. and He spoke that light in, in Genesis verse 2 right there, or verse 3, rather. He spoke that light into being. Of his own holiness, I suppose. But I'm just talking about the sovereignty of God. He didn't have to have a team of scientists to mix some concoction up. He didn't need billions of years to evolve into something. He's a holy and righteous God that's always been. He created things in his perfect timing. And when it's time to, to set things in order and, and make it go and spin and keep all the... I love how the planets are all on an axis. I used to be amazed as a little kid with a mechanical mind. Now, at that stage, it was a take-things-apart mind. And later, it became a put-back-together mind. But you had, they had those things. I forget what they called them uh, in school. And I used to think that was the coolest toy in the world. But the teacher really didn't let you play with it. But you had the sun, the solar system... And those little bars out there and the, had the little chains and they all, when you spun it around, they would all revolve on the correct axis best they knew at the time of uh, how they spun, how they were in order. And I always thought, well, maybe all the planets and all didn't, but I think Earth and the moon and all that part of it did. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Those little things, pretty neat little, uh, they probably, that's a, probably on a computer or something now. They probably don't have the mechanical ones with the chains to cut your fingers off like we did. But I always thought that was pretty cool. But God set that in order. The little planets on their axis compared to the sun. And it's just amazing to me that God's kept that in order, perfectly in order. And the times are set by that and kept by that and maintained and it's never lost a minute. It's perfect. Before there was man, there was God, obviously. We see down a few verses where he made man. said, let us make man. Then it goes back through the actual setting and order of all that's mentioned in the first few verses. Before there was animals, before there was stars or any of the above in those next few verses, there was God in his sovereignty ruling the universe that he would create and make. And, and the amazing thing is, if that isn't hard enough to get your mind wrapped around, the fact that he knew everything that would take place for all eternity forward from that day backwards he, he's God 
I, the fellow today, and he was very sincere, very kind. I enjoyed a conversation with him at some point. His other helper pulled up on his mower and he cut it off, and he kind of got in conversation. I said, fellas, I said, we got to break this for you. I said, Keith, I'm, right now I'm actually stealing Keith's time that we're paying him for with y'all out here working, so y'all get back to work, and I get on back in here, you know. But uh, he's very kind, but uh, he was asking those, you know, those questions, where where'd God come from and all, all these type things. Last two weeks, we spent a little time pointing out some false teachings uh, regarding God's sovereignty. I don't want to give any more time right now to the tulip theology. I like to expose there. I think we should in preaching the whole counsel of the word. I think there's room in there that we should expose heresy and expose false teaching uh, enough that our, that, I mean, it's kind of like, a, you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible about sheep and and shepherd, I think a wise shepherd would, if he could talk to sheep and tell them what don't eat, I think he'd say that over there's poison, stay away from that. And I believe as an under shepherd, I have that same responsibility to point out, but not yet to harp on heresies all the time. And I don't want to spend a great deal of time on it, but I believe it's right to, to point out heresies and point out um, false teachings and uh Sometimes even to show why the people that believe false things believe how they twist scriptures to come up with what they believe. But if we just teach truth, you'll understand. You'll, you know, I've always heard the illustration that bank tellers and train, I don't know this to be true, but I can imagine it probably has some truth to it, that they're not, they don't spend a lot of time showing them counterfeit bills and teaching them counterfeit bills and showing that. They let them handle real money and handle continuously handle real money that if you handle the real money you'll spot the fake real quick I don't know if that's the way the banks do that or not because uh, I'd have to say this counterfeits got pretty slick nowadays and I say that as in the devil and in his methods he's got pretty slick too he always has been but he has so many things that look so close to the real uh, the subject of sovereignty I think probably one of the most simple things in the Bible or verses in the Bible or truths in the Bible that would kind of sum up the, the sovereign, the God's authority, being that he's the highest power, the highest ruler, self-ruling. He needs nobody to, he doesn't have to seek counsel and ask anybody what they think about it. He's God. He, he, he sets everything in order. He makes these rules. But in Isaiah 55, there's an interesting passage up there, but it's got to do with seeking him where he may be found and, and all, it's a lot of good truths in there. But in, in Psalm, I, did I say Psalm? I meant Isaiah. I don't know what I said. But Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my, th my thoughts than your thoughts. Y'all probably heard me refer to it. I hope maybe some of you ever heard this message, but... Dr. Larry Brown, that pastored Victor Baptist Church in North Augusta, South Carolina, is known for a message, ain't nobody like him. Well, if you ever, some, someday you ought to Google that and take an hour and listen to him preach that message. You know, he's preached at a lot of different places all over, saying, so don't tell them what version you'll get of it. But I ain't heard a bad version of it. Well, let's go. Tonight, let's do things a little bit different. We spent this time in Genesis just talking about the, the beginning, and the beginning is God. That tells me all I really need to know about it. So as a believer, I, I, don't question, I don't have a problem with the, the thought that he's the supreme being in the universe and just always being. I, I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to have science, a man to mix something up in a jar and tell me what he thinks that that jar says, how, how old he thinks that something is because of some experiment they're doing uh, I, would, I would question carbon dating by if something's 14 million years old. Do you have a, something there that you started the dating at 14 million years ago to prove that it's 14 years old? Do you have a standard? No, all of that is based on theory. I just believe God created it all. I believe he did it six literal days. Job, turn to the book of Job with me if you would. Let's look at some things of points of God's sovereignty. Job chapter 38. 
we already saw it in the beginning there was God, and then he set in order and created those things in the universe. But Job chapter 38, number one, on the subject of the sovereignty, just in some practical ways, how do we apply this? Where does it, where does it matter? And, uh, well, I mean, it matters a lot. But the good thing is it doesn't have to matter to us because he's got it. He's controlling. He's running it. This outfit's going to run as long as he wants it to run like it's running. And when he catches his bride out of here and takes us home and he changes the, does the things he's going to do, well, he's going to do it in his perfect time. And we don't have to, uh, I'm not worried about it. He's got it. I'm glad, of, I'm thankful for his sovereignty. Boy, get a bad storm come up, a tornado coming toward us, whatever. I'm not saying I don't get scared or don't run to the center part of our room or watch the uh, weatherman talk about and all that. But I know God's sovereign. He's in control. He's got it. That don't mean he's not going to let it hit me. But if, but if he hits me and it scatters me all over planet Earth, that's good. He's sovereign. He said he'd save me. He said he'd take me to heaven if I trusted him and he forgave my sins. So I, I rest in his sovereignty tonight. In Job chapter 38, verse 1, the Bible says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Wait a minute, I'm, let me, I'm, I'm reading off my iPad. Let me go back a few pages. I skipped over and went back over a little bit too far. I was in Psalm 38, and it did not say what I was wanting to read. I mean, what I was reading to you out of, my, out of my, the right place. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darken, darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Who are we to say God's right or wrong or to question his authority? And it goes on and says, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand thee, demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. You know, and people argue about when and how and all that. I, I, I mean, I, I'll try biblically to show you the truth, but I'm not spending a lot of time arguing about it because I just know God did it in the way he did it. Who, it says, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth to declare if thou hast understanding? I don't have to understand it. I understand God did it. That's what matters. That's all that matters to me. Who has laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? You know, I think about the guide wires on a power pole or a tower, a tower of lights or receivers on top of it or something, and, and those cables and lines precisely laid out that keep everything straighten in order and all that and it's, it's talking about like if there was imaginary lines that the when you lay out the foundation before you lay a building you know you shoot those lines and you draw the pull those strings to those lines and he's talking about when the planet's not always first creating everything's lined up perfectly in order and all that well god did it he said it that way and it works what man could do that what man could even think about doing that i we was uh riding to jubilee last week and talking about the size of the job on the 1675 interchange how would you like if somebody gave you a tablet of paper and a calculator and a ruler and said draw this up we need these three interstate well the north and south 75 and 16 east and west to merge together and you got a river right in the middle of it and a city and a historical graveyard and you got all this how about draw that up you got about 30 minutes to do that <laughs> man i just i can't even fathom just one bridge of that that monstrosity of engineering and that's just one little bitty speck of speck of dust on old planet earth imagine doing the whole design and laying out earth and that's just one of one constellation or not yeah milky way ain't we a constellation ain't that what you call it yeah galaxy that's what i'm looking for there you go there you go constellation that's like the dippers and all ain't it yeah i had to see but <laughs> how big it is there you go kind of case in point there don't nobody go home and say your pastor says we live in the Big Dipper either. <laughs> but it goes on, and, and Job, you can just read on through this. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath, who, uh, or hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or, why had, uh, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
I believe it's referring to angels, sons of God. They're angels. Uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as it had issued out of the womb? Uh, when I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick, and thick darkness and swaddling band uh, for it, a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and there shall thy proud ways be stayed. And just think about that, the gravity that holds the oceans in place and the waves, and they beat on the shores and continuously, and it's got to do with the timing of the moon spinning around the earth, and it's spinning. It's just amazing. But that's a little bitty something to God. But in his sovereignty, he just controls it all. He runs it all. He's in charge. My point being in turning there is just, number one, God's in charge of the universe. All the physical realm of things that we ever see, he's in control of it. He's in charge of it. He's sovereign over it too. In Psalm 147, let's just turn back there and uh, look at just a couple, maybe glance at a couple of verses. No, I wait no minute, aren't you? All right, Psalm 147 uh, says, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathered together the outcast of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Now, there's a power in another realm there, but let's go back to the, to the other. He telleth the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. I just not long ago saw something where they think they've discovered another universe. No, galaxy. I get mixed up. But they've, you know, in their great telescopes and all the technology, they think they found another one. It does. It really does. You know, when they, these scientists make all these great discoveries, they figure something out. Well, God knew it all along. And billions of years before he created it, he knew exactly where he'd put it and where it'd stay until he took it down. So, yes, it does make me laugh. And you know what? It makes God laugh, too, and he speaks of that in his word, that uh, the wise and those that have figured him out, he's much wiser and he'll He'll little them down. That's not what the Bible says. That's what I said, little them down. Um, Lord lifted up the weak. Wait a minute. Uh, okay, he telleth the number of the stars. He called them all by their names. There's a good song that uses that verse in it, by the way, too, if y'all have ever heard that song. Uh, great is the Lord of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifteth up the weak. The meek. He casteth the wicked down the ground, singing to the Lord of thanksgiving, sing praise unto the harp of our God, upon the harp of our God, uh, who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. No strength or nothing to it. He's almighty. He created all that. But it just goes on and on. There's so much in the Bible and creation. And it, but God's sovereign. He, he created all. It's all his design. And, man, I'm thankful for it. I like the way he laid it out. To be honest with you, I love nature. I'm not a tree hugger, but I love beautiful trees. Uh, I, I don't worship animals. I enjoy eating, but I also enjoy looking at them in a pretty field and in their home and natural habitat and mowing. I see a lot of beautiful crit critters and creatures. I see a lot of rabbits and different animals and things. I don't know if any of y'all seen the video I have of the kill deer bird on her nest. I saw her last year this time, the same place. Maybe another bird, but exact same place. And if you're not familiar with the kill deer, they lay their eggs on the ground. They nest them. It's programmed them in my, my sovereign, righteous, holy God made them where if you disturb them, they're on nest. If you walk up on them, well, one of them will fly and dart about you to distract you so you don't see the mom on the, or the daddy, whoever's on the nest. But if you walk up, you say, what are you talking about birds for? Because God made all this. 
Those little birds, well, they're pretty good size. But God in his creation has programmed those birds where if you walk up to them, they'll flutter. I've got a video. On my, I'll put it on there. I'll share it with you. They'll flutter. I reached down and petted her. She was not going to abandon those babies. I petted her on her head. She's steady, shaking those little wings and hollering at me. But normally when you walk up to them, they'll fly about from here to that wall and flip around on the ground like they got a broke wing. I mean, you can watch them do it all day. There's videos, piles of videos, but normally that's what they do. I've seen it do it countless times when I ride my mower by it. And I'll steer around them. I'll put a little stick out there by our marker and steer around and go back and pull the little weeds around or let her be, let her have her babies grow up, the babies. But God made those critters. I mean, that's a natural known thing about kill deer birds. They nest on the ground. And they'll fly over here and act like they got a broken wing so a predator will leave their babies alone and go after them. That's the sovereign God created that. Programmed a bird to trick out other animals. And that's only one of the miracles in the animal kingdom. Uh, he's in control of the universe. The fellow today asked, why does he let bad things happen? Why do good people die and all this? Well, we kind of got sidetracked, didn't get continue that, but the bottom line is the wages of sin is death. It's because of sin and man's sin, not because of each individual sin that we're each punished for. You know, everybody dies in a car wreck. doesn't mean that they deserve that death because of their sin, but it's just in general because we've sinned against God that uh, death comes about. Had Adam and Eve not sinned, they would have lived forever. But God does do certain things in his sovereignty. He answers prayers. And he doesn't break his sovereignty to change things that he said in order. Well, I'm, oh, I'm trying to, I may word that in a way I can't get myself out of that box. But I'm just trying to say he answers prayers. And, and uh, well, let me read you this. Sherry Conley of Oklahoma, uh, in an interview with the Daily Oklahoma, Oklahoman, uh, she told him this, her and her husband and two sons were huddled away in the hallway. A tornado was coming. And uh, they got huddled to get away in the hallway linen closet for protection from that tornado. They could hear it rumbling toward them and just started praying and asking God for protection. protection. And uh, said after the, said that, so they got in there and prayed. And when the tornado passed and they opened the door of the closet, that closet was the only part of the house standing when they opened that door that little closet God protected that, that just that was all that was left right there. So he's sovereign in allowing the clouds to come together and the pressures that go with those clouds and the temperatures and the winds that create tornadoes, but he's also sovereign enough to answer prayer. He's just an amazing God. God's in control of the plants and animals. Psalm 104, I already kind of mentioned that a little bit. Psalm 104, 21, the young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. We just read that in Psalm 146 about those, the beasts of the field looking for their meat, their food from God. God created it. And uh, in Jonah, it's amazing how God, in this little story of Jonah, how God had to deal with the animals and uh, plant animal kingdom and the story of that. And that's not the only story in the Bible that deals with this subject. But in Jonah 117, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I'm almost humored sometimes, sister, back to the laughing at them. I see people that are smarter than God and smarter than the Bible. They say, well, everybody knows that a whale's digestive system and his throat passes and all that isn't big enough and all that. Well, it may not be on planet Earth, but it was on that whale. You know, it might, you, may, you may not find another example of it, but that one right there did. It swallowed Jonah up. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah 4, 6, he left the animal kingdom and went to the plant kingdom. And not the this kingdom, but you know what I'm talking about. It says, and the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. So God created a gourd. Anybody ever had a gourd grow up over the head in one night? Just sit there and you... And you just saw it grow up and come up over there. It reminded me of some of them old cheap horror movies when I was a little boy, you know. <laughs> them orchids had come alive and all that stuff. But uh, I think, well, they may not. But, you know, the Jack and the Beanstalk story, that's fiction. But Jonah's gourd really grew up overnight. Come up and covered him. Put him made him up in place. And then Jonah 4-7, but God prepared a worm 
And the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. I don't know, research, it'd be funny to find out. It's probably not any worm that's deadly to a, a growing gourd like that, but that one did. It's all that matters. He's in control of the nation, Psalm twenty-two, twenty-eight. 28, for the king, kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Oh, don't think for a minute we got uprising and, you know, Mr. Kim over there in North Africa. I saw a picture of him the other day. said he didn't do what? Korea, not Africa. Yes, thank you. Pretty bad in my geography there, wasn't I? But I saw a picture of him the other day, and I don't know if you don't know if we see anything on the news if it's real or not. They can fake anything. By the way, there's videos out there. They can have me preaching and change and use my voice and my lips on there and make me say anything they want you to say. I forget what it's called, that, but they can do that. So don't believe everything you see a person on TV saying anymore. You'll see excerpts of this person or this talking head and such as that and all. It may or may not be real. It can look real and be their voice. But anyway, I saw a picture where that fellow was, they say he's 300 pounds and in terrible health now. I don't know if it's true or not. Personally, don't really care. But if he thinks he's in control and going to control and all that, no, only only if the Lord lets him. The Lord's in control of him too. He's in control of every leader. can overrule them. He can give them power. I've been reading th through some of the Old Testament recently, reading through Ezra. But it says from the Old Testament, I mean, how God you and knew as well, and even now, how God's used heathen nations to judge his children when they were disobedient. So that alone shows that he's in control and allows things to happen. He's a sovereign. He's in control of man's life, Luke 12, 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And then we know the Bible says it's appointed once to man to die. And then the judgment in Hebrews. But God's sovereign. He's in control of everything that goes on. It doesn't mean we're pre-programmed and we do every thought that he puts in our mind. He knows our thoughts. It doesn't make it mean he makes our thoughts. We're free moral agents. He sets us in order. He gives us health uh, or, or, or not. But he designed and gives us a body and a brain and a, to use to think, and to make decisions pleasing to him. So we're not programmed robots. We're free moral agents. We have the ability and the God-given right to choose. I can choose to serve God and read my Bible and pray and study and prepare and preach a message. Or I could choose to to not, it may not be happy. I'd probably be a most miserable person. You don't have to do right. You can sin. You can, there's not a person here not capable of committing any sin you committed before you got saved. And if you differ with that, be careful because pride will take you down a dark, lonely road if you don't believe that could happen. And I didn't say it's likely and hopefully not. We Hopefully we'd have better judgment and make better decisions than that. I'm just trying to say in God's sovereignty, he didn't program us. His sovereignty includes giving us, making us free moral agents, letting us think for ourselves and make decisions and such as that. And you have to understand right and divide the word of God that, that his sovereignty, he, you know, I love the saying, he's so sovereign he gave us a choice. He didn't program us to eternity one way or the other or to everything I say that is programmed of God. Hopefully it's led of God or it definitely be judged of God but the sovereignty of God. Aren't you glad he's sovereign? Aren't you glad he's in control that he knows? I am too. And I'm new. I'm glad that I'm, I'm not new. I'm pretty old. But I meant to say I'm glad that he knew long time ago when that beginning God, verse 1, that some years later they'd be a little smart aleck teenage boy not fit to save, not deserving of any good that's ever come my way. He'd know that I would be a sinner on my way to hell and I'd need a, need a Savior. And some years after he created everything, 
By the way, he, planted, he created the trees, and there's so much you got to do with the day of Calvary and the creation week. He knew it all ahead of time, that, but he knew that one day I'd need to be saved, that each one of you would need to be saved. And he had that plan drawn out before the foundation of the world. The, the Lamb of God, was, the plan was laid out for him to be slain for my sin and yours. And all that's got to do with the sovereignty. I'm glad he's a sovereign God. I'm glad he's an amazing God. I'm glad he's a loving God that hears and answers prayers that took on a body and became man and died for my sin if yours. Do you know him tonight as your Savior? And I, I ask you, as you, are you struggling with things in your life that he's got control of in his sovereignty that you just need to turn it over to him and say, Lord, would you take this and give me strength through it and help me with it? Or protect me from it, guide me from it, or whatever need be, the case need to be. What do you need to do? Not I, I rest in the sovereignty of God. It's not a troubling doctrine to me. I, I may not understand all the ins and outs of it and all, but I'm completely okay and satisfied with just knowing He's in control. He created all. He's in control. He knows everything's going to happen, and He's got a grand and master plan, and it's all going to be to His glory when it's all said and done. And I rest in that daily. When I doubt that, I'm not at peace and I, and I have unrest. But when I stop and think about that and focus on that, it's all good. In spite of troubles, and it's everything that happens good. He's, just, he's sovereign. He's almighty. Praise his holy name tonight. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, I do thank you for the truth of your sovereignty. Lord, I probably haven't even scratched the surface of the subject. God, I, I pray that it's been enough said, Lord, that we'd uh, understand how big and mighty you are and how in control you are. Lord, we, God, we just rest entirely in your grace and your power and your might. We thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew, he's good, isn't he?